but we are going to go right to our, our scripture this morning, which comes from Genesis chapter number two. And it's just one verse that we're going to read. And so I'm going to trouble you one more time, just out of reverence to the reading of God's word. And it is a custom of this house that we stand for the reading of God's word. And so it's just one verse, so you won't be standing long. As long as you are able to stand and we're inviting you to do so. Genesis uh, chapter number two and verse number 18. And it says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. It is not good for man to be alone. And I just want to talk to us this morning from the subject that there is strength in numbers. There is strength in numbers. Every head bowed in this house. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here again. Thank you for allowing us the grace to stand on this spot of ground, undeserving, unworthy. Oh God, but thank you for the blood of Jesus that makes us clean, that gives us clean hands, that gives us a pure heart. Father, we are grateful this morning that the entrance of your word would give life is what we ask today. Speak to the hearts of your people today, Lord. Restore somebody that they break down walls today. God, build us up and make us who you want us to be in you today. Oh God, thine is the kingdom today, Lord. Yours is the power and yours is all of the glory both now and forevermore. And let the people of God say amen. 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 You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. There is strength in numbers. There is strength in numbers. Uh, we, we, we started the series, uh, I believe, a week ago. And the series is uh, titled uh, Life Together. Life Together. Now, it's, it's real, a little bit challenging for me. I'm going to put myself out there and tell you the truth. It's a little bit challenging for me to address this topic because it means I have, I'm going to have to put myself out there. It's, it's, it's one of the messages where I got to look at me. And uh, sometimes I don't like looking at me. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't like looking at me because looking at me means I have to look at all of me, look at my flaws, look at the things I don't like about me, look, about, look at the things that challenged me and provoked me sometime. And so it, it was kind of hard to kind of present this word. See, uh, you guys may get to hear this message once, maybe twice if you go back and listen to podcasts or you go check it out on our YouTube channel. That's a shameless plug, by the way. You can go back and uh, listen to the podcast every Sunday in our YouTube channel. Uh, but you, you, you may hear it maybe twice. I would have heard it God knows how many times already. It's been playing back and forth in my head and God has just been speaking to me and I don't get to sleep Sometimes that's why I like preaching. Pass the plug right there for me too. Um, but, but you know, God speaks on a consistent basis. And so the word is always just playing in, in, in my head. And it, it really provokes and challenges me. And you, you'll find out why as, as we progress and as we move along in this message. But as, as I began to meditate on this, this, this topic, on this series, Life Together, I, I couldn't help but go back to my upbringing. I, I grew up in, in, in what I believe was a collective environment, right? So we believed in doing any, everything as a unit. I, I grew up in Jamaica, uh, and I left when I was 11 years old, but I grew up as everything being about a community. We believed that a village raised a child, right? So much so that there was nothing I could get away with, right? So none of us was able to get away with anything because if, even if I was away from home and I was on the street, God help me if somebody knew my parents and saw me out there. They would definitely reprimand me. And so I'm from Jamaica again, so they, they spank you in Jamaica. And there is no, I'm calling 911. There was no 911. Um, because they'd show up and probably spank you on top of that too. But in any case, they, there was none of that, right? And so after you got the discipline, wherever it was that you were in the streets, honestly, you you prayed to God when you got home, they didn't run into your parents. Because if they ran into your parents, they would have told your parents, and you're going to get another one for the same thing. So it was, it was a community thing. They believed in just raising people together. They had what we call neighborhood watches, where the community came together, and it was out of concern, not so much for an individual, but it was a concern for a unit. It was a concern for a community. So if one person was suffering in our community, everybody else was suffering, right? I grew up where we were able to go knock on somebody else's door and borrow some sugar. Y'all know about that, right? Folks are looking at me like, sugar, that's right, sugar. We'd go borrow sugar from people. Not like you can give it back, but yeah. 
Uh, but, but that was the kind of community that we, we grew up in. And then I, I migrated to the US and, and found out that this, this is not a collective unit place. By no mean, we are very individualistic here as a culture. And so it took, it took a while to get adjusted to autonomy, where everything was just about me, where it, it, it was, uh, it's selfishness to some degree, uh, where, where, where it's about being independent as a unit. It, it's not even as a unit, as an individual, you are told that you need to be independent. And so it kind of pushes you into a place of isolation where it teaches you not to become dependent on anybody else. It, it, to, to, the, to the extent sometimes that it, you were looked at as weak if you were to be dependent on other people. You, you were seen as, as less than, as it were, if you, you, you can get through doing certain things without asking for help. It, you would look really, really bad, but that, that's just weird to me. And so I began to think about it, and so I had to get back into the word of God. And when I, when I got back, I, I had to go back to the book of beginnings, the book where it, it, it all got started. It all got started in, in, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis. And we, we read chapter 2 a minute ago, but I, I looked in the book of Genesis, and, and, and chapter 1 outlines a few things, right? And it outlines for us God's creative power. And the Bible said that he created the light from the darkness, right? He, he created the sun, the moon, the stars. He, he created the living creatures that walked on the ground and those that would crawl on their belly. He would put the birds in the air and the fishes in the sea. He, he exercised his creative power. And six times after everything's for six days, every time God created something, he would turn around and he would say that it was good. It was good. He would, as it were, praise himself. He was praising the thing that he created. He said that it was good because it was pleasing to him. It was pleasing, very, very pleasing to him. And he, he went through, the, the author of the book of Genesis, Moses, uh, kind of went through all of God's creative acts in chapter number one. Right, and I, I kind of looked at it, and there's some things in it that, that kind of jumped out at me, and I, I thought about it, right? So the first thing that God did, God did not create. That was not the first thing that God did. The first thing that I recognized that God did was that God spoke. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, God spoke. And, and it, 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 it marveled me when I thought about the fact that God spoke. Because when God speaks, I realize that something has to happen. The, the, the voice of God causes things that are non-existent to come into existence. The voice of God is extremely powerful. If you don't believe me, check it out. In, in, in the New Testament, when Jesus operated, every miracle that Jesus ever performed preceded a word. It preceded him speaking something. Check it out. It, it, his first miracle it, at Cana of Galilee, the Bible said that he was at the wedding and his mother came to him and told him that they ran out of wine. Jesus says, well, what does this have to do with me? He says, woman, my hour is not yet come. Then she turns to the servants that were there and she says, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you ought to do. When, when we checked it out, by the graveside of Lazarus, when he showed up, Lazarus was dead and lying in a tomb, bound up, and it took a word from God. He stood by the graveside of Lazarus and opened his mouth, and what he said was, Lazarus come forth. And then what happened? The miracle proceeded. The man that was laying by the pool of Bethesda laid there, I believe, for 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, what did Jesus do? Jesus asked the man a question. What was the question? He says, will thou be made whole? It was a question. And the response to the question preceded the miracle. If you don't
don't believe me, let's keep going. They were on the boat out there in the middle of the ocean. Jesus was asleep and the storm arose. They woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we're out here and about to perish? How can you lay here sleeping? Jesus got up and what did he do? He looked at the winds and the wave and what did he do? He spoke a word and said, Peace be still. Oh, good God. The disciples were out fishing and the Bible says that they were out there all day and all night and they caught absolutely nothing. Jesus shows up on the scene after preaching and he looks at them and says, throw your net out there for another cast. They said, man, what you talking about? What you know about no fishing? I've been out here all day and all night throwing my net down and I ain't catch nothing. But then Peter paused and said, you know what? Nevertheless, Lord, at thy word I'm gonna let my net down and the minute they obeyed God and threw the net down the Bible said they pulled in a great multitude of fishes what is it that you've got going on in your life all you need to do is ask God to speak I know the presence of God is powerful I don't want to take away anything from that. But what good it is it to me if God would show up and nothing happens? But when God shows up, I want God to speak. Oh God, I want when God shows up, he would utter a word. One word, hallelujah, can heal your sickness. One word can fix your illnesses. One word can change your finances. One word can change your entire marriage. One word can turn that crazy child around. One word can get them off of drugs. One word can turn this community upside down. All we need is a word from the Lord for if he speaks the Bible says all the songs I grew up in church they would sing that his voice it makes a difference when he speaks it relieves our troubled mind it's something about the voice of God when God speaks something has to happen and so whatever it is that you're in don't just invite the presence of God to show up but when you ask his presence there, when he shows up, ask him to speak. Because if he speaks, I guarantee you there is a miracle right behind it. There is absolutely nothing too hard for our God. All it takes is a word from our God. Just one word. Just one word. Just one word. Just one word. The second thing I, I, I noted in, in the creation that, that, that's worth mentioning is... I recognize that when God created all the things that he created, he created, as it were, everything in peer or in opposites. So he did the sun and the moon. He, uh, he, 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 did, he separated the light from the darkness. He threw the birds in the air to fly, and then he threw the fishes in the sea. He did everything, as it were, in in, in peers, in, in peers, in peers. Then he went on and he decided that he would create man. He would create humanity and he created them in peers. The Bible says male and female created he them. Hold on to that right there real quick because we're going to go back there. He created them, them in peers. And the third thing I, I, I want to note is the fact that God, after creating man, didn't just drop him in the earth realm and just leave him. But God gave him a job. He, he had an assignment to do. He told him to, to take care of, of the ground. He, he told him to, to, to be fruitful later on, he says, and, and multiply and re replenish the earth. He gave him instructions. He gave him a job. But not only did he give him a job to do, but God also gave him things. Right? God gave him a uh, uh, seed bearing plants. He gave him trees that would produce fruits with seeds in it. He gave him the animals of the earth, the walking creatures. He gave him the birds of the air. He gave him every creeping thing that was crawling. God gave it to him and says, it is yours. You have dominion, have authority authority over it right so God gave him a job and not only did God give him a job but God gave him a pay God gave him some stuff God gave him some stuff 
behind behind it all. So then we get over to Genesis number two after God finished creating everything and then saying it was good. Then we get to chapter number two and verse number 18. And for the first time we see God going, it is not good. But you just told me in Genesis chapter one, after you created everything, that it was all good. Everything that he created was good. Then I recognized that chapter one of the book of Genesis is a broad picture of everything that God did, right? One, one theologian or one scholar says that the possibility was that God created everything that he created really in one day and spent the next few days putting order to things. So he spent his time uh, putting all of these things in the earth realm. And then we get to chapter two. And what chapter two of Genesis does is he begins to put some details to how God did what he did in Genesis chapter number one. And so what we're seeing in chapter two isn't that God is now creating woman. Woman, I believe, was already created in chapter one when God says, let us make humanity all the author is now doing in chapter 2 is painting a picture, or giving us the details as to what God did in chapter number 1. Right? It, it, it's key to note the fact that God is, uh, is very strategic in saying that it is not good that human beings would be alone. So when he made Adam, he wasn't pleased with the fact that Adam was by himself as a whole, as an individual. I believe Adam was whole uh, and God was well pleased with his creation because he at the moment without sin was reflecting the image and the beauty of God. And so when God looked back at what he had created, God was very pleased, which is why he was able to say that it is God. Good. So we get over here and God now says, I don't want man to be alone. I need him to have a help me. Everything else was now created in peers. And so as a social being, I need Adam to have somebody to socialize with. I need Adam to have someone that he can relate to, right? The birds have each other to relate to. The fishes have each other to relate to. The walking animals and the crawling animals all had something to relate to that was on their level. But the Bible says for Adam, there was no help meet. And so God says, I'm going to send him some help. And I don't want to take this thing out of context. In its proper context, this thing now deals with relationship between a man and a woman. But I just want to highlight the first few lines of that verse where it says, God says it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good that man should be alone. And I, I started out by telling you the kind of culture that we live in, a very individualistic society where we celebrate uniqueness and independence even to a far extent. And there's nothing wrong with being independent, so don't get me wrong. And there's nothing wrong with us celebrating our uniqueness, right? There is absolutely nothing wrong with those things, but it's a problem when we go to the extreme of saying we don't need anybody else. That's, that's when it becomes a problem when we decide that we want to live in isolation away from people and away from things and only deal with people as we wish and as we see fit, right? No longer are we willing to self-sacrifice how we feel sometimes. It's, it's always about me. That's the kind of generation that we're now living in. And if you don't believe me, check out social media. There's nothing but a bunch of selfies posted on social media. I know I wasn't going to get no amens on that one because all y'all are guilty of it, including me too. So that's why I told you it's kind of hard to preach this and not put myself in the middle of this. Uh, uh, but we're a selfish, as it were, generation where we become super consumed with us and not so much concern about the next person and how they may feel and how what you do may affect them or affect them. But God is calling us and he says it is not good 
for us to be alone. Now, as an individual, there's so much that you can do. Our pastor spoke to us last week about being salty in the earth. And while he was preaching, he touched on a few things. One of the things he talked about was the individual and how God would use one. Hallelujah. If you go over to the book of Judges, the Bible tells us about Samson. It was one man that God decided that he would raise up and he would use and bless him with supernatural strength and Samson would use the jawbone of a donkey. I won't say the other word because some folks might get offended even though it's in the Bible. But some folks might be offended. He used the jawbone of a donkey. I'm going to just leave it right there. And the Bible said that he would defeat thousands. The Bible told us about Gideon who felt insignificant and yet God used Gideon to defeat the Midianites I believe it were. Then there was Deborah. Then there was Barak. The book of Judges is all laced with men who individually was used by God. But I don't want to just stop there. Can I tell you, there were more people that God used as an individual, but then there were some that he connected people to. Because even Gideon, though Gideon was mighty by himself, God gave Gideon an army. So though Gideon was powerful all on his own, the Bible said that God gave Gideon an army to fight with, an army to fight with. He had company behind him. And if you don't believe it, there, this is what I'm trying to tell you, that there is strength in numbers. You may not need the mass. This is right. You may not need the masses. Why? Because even Gideon got cut his army down from 300,000, I believe it was, to 3,000. God cut them down, but there was still more than just Gideon. We love to talk about David, and David was a mighty man, probably one of my favorite Bible characters. Why? Because his life is all out there and it's all exposed. And if David can be the man after God's own heart, after all of his mess, then guess what? My life is also a little mess. And so God shows me through David that I still got use, that I can still be redeemed, that I still got purpose, that he still has a plan for me, that I was still in his mind. Because even while I was in my sins, the Bible says that Christ died for me. Don't sit there and look all cute and like you all goody goody, like you got it all together. Now you may have it together, but you didn't always have it together. If we were to just roll back the curtains of your life and peek in the closets if I was even to probably scroll through your cell phone you know I might find some stuff in there that ain't got no business being in there but thank God for the blood of Jesus that covers our stuff that covered my mess and David shows me that God can use a flawed individual but God did not use David by himself he gave David a Jonathan hallelujah God gave David a Jonathan and Jonathan was David's partner in crime as it were Jonathan was the guy that was looking out for David even against his own father that was trying to kill David Jonathan said David I got your back that's what some of us need we need people in our lives that's going to have our backs there is strength in numbers there is strength in numbers God went to the extreme to create a help me to help me an assistant an assistant an assistant to 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 Adam because he knew that Adam by himself wasn't going to be the best that he could be and can I tell you you by yourself will never be the best that you can be there is so much that is in you and the lie that the enemy has told many of us is that what is in us is for us to get to the next level but can I tell you that what's also in you is not just for you but it's for somebody else you have a gift you've got a talent you've got an ability that somebody else needs to make their life better you've got that skill of counseling that somebody needs you've got that skill of listening and somebody needs your ears you've got that gift to play music and somebody needs to hear you tickle them keys 
or play on that string instrument or play them drums. You've got ability that somebody else needs to enhance the kingdom of God. You don't need to go this thing by yourself. You have more effective or you are more effective when you've got numbers with you. You don't believe me? Let's go back to the word of God because in Matthew the Bible says, in fact in Deuteronomy rather, 32 and I believe verse 12, the Bible says that one of us can chase a thousand but two of us can put 10,000 to flight. I don't know about you but I'd rather have 10,000 running away from me more than just a thousand out of the 10,000. Come on here somebody. You need to connect with somebody. The Bible says that we're two or three of us can come together and agree on anything that concerns him. The Bible says that he is in the midst to bless not by yourself. He'll show up for you. But if you can just get with somebody else and begin to call on the name of God, get with somebody else and begin to agree with them about whatever it is that you are desiring from God. God says, I will hear from heaven. There is strength in numbers. You don't need to go this thing alone. What you've got is beneficial to somebody else right here in this room. Possibly on your job and in your house. Go get all you can get. But at the end of the day, we are always going to need people. You are better off when you've got somebody else connected to your vision, to your plan, to whatever it is that you are dealing with. You don't need to go this thing alone. Life is mean. The older I get, the more I realize that life plays no game. It takes no captives. It goes after everything that you've got. It does not play fear. And it is very difficult for you to maneuver life all by yourself. Can you imagine if Pastor had decided he wanted to start this church in a city where he knew nobody by himself? You would not be sitting here. I would not be standing here. What would your life be? Think about it. In fact, you wouldn't even sit here. None of us would be sitting here if our parents had said, I'm doing this thing alone. Yeah, yeah, tell me about artificial insemination. That's now. None of y'all wasn't born now. I'm talking about then. None of us would be sitting in this room if our parents that had decided to go it alone. And I'm trying to show you that there is strength when you connect with somebody else. And as a church, we realize the importance of that so much so and I'm plugging a whole bunch of stuff here that pertains to this ministry because we're doing this series of life together for a reason. It's, 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 it's intentional. It's intentional. We want folks to connect. Not merely to a church, but we want to be connected as the body of believers. It, it is just something about when we get together as a unit. I, I, my mind goes back to the book of Acts chapter number 2. And the Bible says that it was 120 of them that were gathered together in one place. And while they were in there, the Bible says that they were fasting. They were in prayer together. They were singing together together. And while they were in worship together as a unit, the Bible says there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And you guys listen to me, man. We, we, we put an emphasis on worship here. Because we recognize the power that comes behind worship. But we recognize that worship is more effective when we do it together. Oh God. When one of us is standing up here singing by ourselves, it's one thing. But it's a whole nother beauty when you hear a host of people that's standing in the congregation with every hands up lifted in the presence of God. With every mouth being vocal and singing the praises of God. We put the words upon the screens because we want y'all to join in. I don't want to worship alone. She doesn't want to sing alone. Brad doesn't want to play alone. I don't want to play alone. But I need my brother. I need 
need my sister to come alongside with me and stand with me and lift your hands with me and open your mouth and lift your voice with me. And let's give God glory together. Because when we get together, good God, every devil in hell will have to run out of this place. Sicknesses would be healed. Anointing will destroy yokes. There will be deliverance. There will be breakthrough. There will be freedom. But we've got to get together. We've got to get together. And I don't want to act like it's all going to be easy when we get together. The Bible in the book of Proverbs chapter 27 says uh, that iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. And that's no easy feat. It sounds good. It sounds good. But I don't know if anybody in here cooks. I hope y'all do. Uh, but I cook at home. And, and, and every now and again, I have these knives that I use and, after using them periodically, they get dull. And so I had to go get me a blade sharpener. And what I realized is, every time I take that blade, I'm rubbing metal against metal. Metal against metal. And the more I rub, the sharper it, com it becomes. But in the process of it becoming sharp, there's a bunch of stuff that falls off of it. There's a lot of shavings that fall from it. There's a lot of shavings that fall from it. And so when the word says that iron sharpens iron, when, when I get together with Noah and we begin to rub shoulders with each other and Mark comes alongside and we begin to rub shoulders together, there's some stuff in my life when they begin to talk and he begins to talk, there's some stuff in my life that's going to rub off. There's some stuff that's on Mark that's going to rub off on me. There's some stuff on Noah that's going to rub off on me. There's some stuff that's on me that's going to rub off on them. And it may not feel comfortable. Why? Because you're being sharp and God is using, hallelujah to God. God is using the people that you connect with to shape you. He is using the people that you connect with to rub some things out of your life. I know you're not perfect and God is not calling you to be. But what he wants you to do is to grow from stage to stage, from faith to faith from maturity to maturity and from glory to glory he wants you to strive for perfection which means the things that are in your life needs to be rubbed off there are things that will attach itself to you that somebody else in this room has gone through And if you connect with that individual, God will use them to rub some stuff off of you. The process is not easy. But I want you to know that there is strength in numbers. There are a few things to consider that I call the golden rule of community. So when we connect together, and before I even go there, I began to tell you that we are very intentional as a church about doing life together. So much so that we started doing small groups. It wasn't because we didn't have nothing else to do. We all have important things in our lives that's going on. Most of us in here have got kids, we've got spouses, we've got work, some of us are in school. We've got jobs, some of us two, three, maybe four, hopefully not. Uh, but we've got all these things that consume us and keep us super busy. But we were intentional about not being so busy with things. Think about it. I told you to stick a pin, right? Adam had a job. Adam had things, and yet the job and the things was not substitute for God saying, Adam, I don't want you to be alone. I want you to be in community. I need you to be relational. And so we were intentional when we started the women's group called Roadmap. 
We were intentional when we started fantasy football for the men. We were intentional when we started Next Gen for our young people. We were intentional when we started the Spades group for people who just, I think it's just crazy, by the way. Just pray for me on that one. Uh, but they love Jesus, too. Or oh, they're trying to get to know Jesus. Can I tell you, one of the things I've loved is our Spades group have brought people into attendance. Can I tell you? They don't even believe God. But they're willing to come play spades with some church folks. So we can rub off on each other. I know somebody's going to get mad and knock stuff like that on the podcast. It's your business. Pray your strength in Jesus' name. Uh, but it, it, it's about bringing people into community, into fellowship. We've got a prayer, a prayer team that connects. And our, our, our goal as we get together as a unit to pray is to pray not just for our church, but for our community. We want this community. We want this community. We want people in this community to know that we are here. And so here are my golden rules for community. And I'm going to shut my mouth and sit down after this. The first one is you need to be authentic. People can spot your phoniness a mile away. People want to connect with people that are real, that are not afraid to be vulnerable. And sometimes it might require you telling a little bit on yourself. And I told you earlier that this message was challenging for me because really and truly, I can say, I, I, I'm more of an introvert. Don't let this fool you. I prefer to be by myself. Ideally, but I'm also willing to get out my own comfort zone and plug myself into community and be authentic and be honest around people because authenticity would breathe authenticity. It will set other people free. It will break down walls. If you would ever be honest while you're in community with people, it would allow people to feel more comfortable while they're around you. Number two, be respectful. If you give it, then you will get it. If you give it, then you will get it. While you're in community, respect the boundaries that people set. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make you shout today. I want you to think. But respect the boundaries that are set. Respect people's differences. Respect people's time. Respect people's time. Number three, be understanding. Lose that spirit of judgment. Don't be so quick to cast judgment. My mom used to tell me, she said, son, if you, are, if you live in a glass house, then don't throw stones. Because you live in a glass house. And so somebody else might throw a stone, and the same stone you threw that broke their glass house, it can break yours too. It's always easy to pass judgment when somebody else is going through their stuff. It's always easy to say certain things or to pass judgment on somebody else when you're not in it. When it's their kid that's acting crazy, when it's their marriage that's upside down, when it's their job that's driving them up the wall. And it's easy to pass judgment and say, well, it wouldn't have been like that if you had done this and if you had listened to this one. Wait, just keep living, baby. Keep living. Your turn might just come full circle. Do not hand out judgment to anybody, but be understanding of others. Be compassionate one towards the other. And the last thing is be humble. Humility. Humility goes a long way. Be humble. Be willing to say, I'm sorry. Be willing to apologize. Be willing to see yourself. To acknowledge when you are wrong. And say, I did not mean it that way. I am sorry if I offended you. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I'm sorry I cast judgment on you. I, I'm sorry for misunderstanding you. You are here today. And the word of the Lord comes to you. You are powerful as one. Yes, you are. You are unique, you are independent, but God is calling us today to take your uniqueness and connect it with my uniqueness. 
to take your independence and connect it with my independence and allow us to be collective, to function collectively as a body of believers. Everybody stand to your feet. That we would function, that we would walk this thing out together. Thanks for tuning in. I pray that this word from God blessed you and encouraged you in some way. If it did, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. We want you to stay connected with everything that God is doing at Link Church. And secondly, you can share this with a friend. Maybe you want to share it with a family member. You never know how one word from God will change someone's life. I want to encourage you and let you know that God has a purpose for your life. I'll see you next time. And until then, take care.